Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is Sohini from South Bay, California and I welcome you today. So for everyone who's been following me so far or if you are new to my channel, so far we have been reviewing a 10 week long program called Build Your Own Research Internship in AI and it has been catering more towards people who have some basic understanding of AI and it's sort of a finishing program to help them build their digital portfolio. But today I want to cater this particular session towards the concepts of end-to-end -end learning or end-to-end -end models versus explainable AI models. What are these terms, what they mean, and how you can actually think of models and design problems in your specific domain. So let's say you belong to the finance domain or you could belong to supply chain or in, in management or something totally different which is absolutely uncorrelated with AI. How can you start thinking about methods that are being developed that have artificial intelligence coverage in them. How can you start thinking about them? So these are the two very different ways in which models are envisioned. One is end-to-end -end learning in which your final objective is just to get to the final stage without really having much importance onto explainability or in order to understand limiting conditions that much. However, explainable AI is, is something which has, uh, you know, which has become more important over the past few, uh, two, three years in which importance is much more given given to each and every modules that create the whole uh, you know, system set up. And it, it is, of course, as the word says, more explainable. So it's less like a black box where you have absolutely no control over it, but you want to figure out the ways and steps in which you can actually debug it, generalize it, and even understand where the system fails. So that will be the topic we cover in the session today. If this is of interest to you, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. I wanted to start today's session by saying a huge thank you to everyone who has embarked on my journey so far. It has been absolutely amazing to see uh, your inputs in, in order to understand how I could actually help create more content that can help this community that, that we are building together. So huge and very sincere thank you to everyone for their inputs, comments and feedback. And this week, we actually finish our 10 week long program, which is build your own research internship. Uh, by the end of this week, I will be demonstrating how we, uh, I came up with the whole explainable AI uh, system that we will then be uh, putting on on GitHub. And it will be there for anybody to review, to look at and to get inspiration for or to, you know, develop more in, in future. So we are at week nine of build your own research internship in AI and today we are going to be reviewing end to end models versus explainable AI models. So let's get straight to them. We will start by looking at the definitions. What is the difference between end to end learning which is E2E -E, versus an explainable AI learning? And uh, these definitions are directly from given sources and I'll be linking the sources in the de description box below. So an E2E -E or end-to-end -end model here refers to training a possibly complex learning system represented by a single model, like a deep learning neural network, that represents the complete target system by bypassing the intermediate layers usually presents uh, in, in a traditional pipeline design. So essentially, what does it mean? It means that like a, a deep neural network, what it does is you don't really have to pre-filter uh, the images anymore. You, you don't really need to do a lot of pre-processing, but you the, the deep neural network generally you, you feed the, the, the images as is and it's capable of generating the final outcome that is of interest to you. That's your target system. So here, you don't really understand which part of the neural network is doing which functionality, which is extracting, um, you know, the, the structural features, which is uh, extracting the global features. You have some idea, you know, which layer is doing what, but specifically, it's it's everything is put together in the network and you are only concerned by the final outcome. You don't really care what's happening in each and every one of the stages. That is mostly an end-to-end -end learning system. Now let's understand what is an explainable AI system. An explainable AI system by definition it refers to methods and techniques uh, in the application of AI or artificial intelligence such that the results of the solution can be understood by humans. 
So an explainable AI system in, in, in a typical way would be the traditional pipeline design where you know you, you take a, a particular set of images, you, uh, you construct features in a certain explainable way, you pass it through a general classifier, and then finally you get the outcome. So each and every module or each and every stage that you design, it, you, you know exactly what it is doing, and then you can optimize each and every one of these uh, you know, sub-modules in order to get the best uh, final, out, final outcome. There's a lot of work right now in order to turn end-to-end -end models into explainable models, so in order to explain them more. But traditionally, whenever you design a model, you need to understand you are either trying to do one of one or the other. In industry, most of the times, uh, whenever you are, you know, demoing a proof of concept, you're you're you know traditionally trying to do more of an end-to-end -end learning. And in end-to-end -end learning, you only are concerned by what is the input and what is the output. You don't really care what is happening at each and every stage. However, right now there's a huge push toward explainable AI in the academic as well as in the industrial sectors because people try to tend to shy away from a, a black box sort of a you know deep neural network kind of setting where you can't really explain what is going on and which is detrimental in, in situations where you don't know what sort of a limiting condition might pose. So uh, let's say that for an autonomous drive situation, you are generating this deep neural network network which which works fine for you know object detection however you really don't know in what situations the object detection system will fail so in this case if you are able to explain or modularize the uh, the, the deep learning network in, in a better way you are, will then be able to explain the limiting conditions and and understand uh, how to make those limiting conditions better so explainable AI and E2E are, are two very different paradigms. I would say one is you know, sort of the opposite of the other. And so whenever you are doing your model design, try to think and try to understand what are you trying to design? Is your goal to, to, to make something fast and which you know, finally gets to your outcome very, you know, in, in, in a fast and uh, accurate way? Or is your intention to make something more explainable in order to understand the, the limiting conditions better and to be able to maneuver away from the limiting conditions better? So that should be in, in your head when you uh, start designing uh, you know, traditional models uh, in, in machine learning and AI. So let's look at some examples of image segmentation. On the left hand side for the E2E -E or an end-to-end -end network, this is a, the, the standard UNET model where we have the convolutions as well as pooling for your encoder finally and then you, you become the, the transposed convolution along with pooling in order to uh, you know come to your final output segmented map. And on the right hand side, it's the, the, the explainable AI system is where you would actually first detect the major vessels, which is you know relatively easier to do because you know they're they're thicker so that's that would be a step-by-step -step method first you extract the the major blood vessels and then all of the all the, of the remaining uh, you know pixels at the pixel level you you design features uh, by which you can actually uh, demarcate that this is a vessel versus this is not and finally you put together all the uh, you know vessels together so this would be a much more structured way and here if there are any errors you will be able to figure out at what level is it happening is the error with the you know major blood vessel detection or is the error with the finer blood vessel detection so you will be able to understand the limiting conditions of each and every one of the, you know the the modules and be able to correct it or make it better or uh, you may even be able to generalize it so uh, what we are trying to uh, what we are getting at is an explainable ai system is generally more generalizable because you know exactly what are the limiting conditions of each and every uh, you know subsystems or each and every modules of of the whole uh, pipeline however E2E, it's a little harder to debug and it's it's a little harder to find the limiting conditions because of course you don't really know in, in which exact layer what part of the functionality is going on. So based off of your input and the output, you can actually design what kind of model you really are interested in. Uh, let's come in with respect to the image augmentation. So then with respect to this system, we can have you know two kinds of uh, these, these models again. So an end-to-end -end, uh, model would be where you detect random patches. So let's say that I detect a seed value which is randomly generated and this seed value is typically from 0, 0 to the final you know, height and width of the, of the whole image. So you take the seed value and you generate a square patch in and, in and around. So ideally you can have 
multiple you know ideally you can have you know as many of of random patches as 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 possible uh, and in this case uh, you know the m2 model is actually training with 190000 randomly generated patches now what we want to do is of course here the complexity is the limiting condition is is this 190000 you see this is a huge number of images and you can't really explain why this works because and you can just say that well if i if i have 190000 randomly generated patches then i'm pretty sure Sure that I've extracted you know almost all I've looked at all the uh, parts of the fundus images as possible however there is also a big possibility that you've repeated the, the same region multiple amount of time so it if, if your random number generator is is not random enough if it's pseudo random then you could actually end up with uh, the, the same region being photographed multiple number of times so that would be a, a limiting condition for this E2E or M2 uh, model that we are working with. Now, in this case, the, the, the new pipeline that we have actually designed, this new uh, image augmentation pipeline, what that does is initially it takes every single image and it generates uh, you know several uh, augmented versions by zooming in, zooming out, rotation, and all of that that is using Keras. And you know that's the first uh, set that we do. And then we just extract non-overlapping. So we go you know straight in, in a methodical way in order to extract as as many patches as possible so in this case what we've done is we've for the 20 set of training images first of all we've generated you know 12 images augmentations per image and then after that uh, based off of my my patch size uh, let's say I'm extracting about 144 patches per images and they're not overlapping right so in this case you are you you can actually extract up to 34,000 so you see 34,000 is much lesser this, than 190 and if you're able to get the same accuracy by both of these methods you've actually been able to explain the system, you know, why it works. Uh, you, you now have modularized this uh, data augmentation strategy and now you will know exactly what the limiting conditions of each and every module is. And also you've been able to control the complexity. So this would be the, the, the standard uh, system design that we have looked at uh, last week and I'll be linking those videos uh, right about now. And what we are doing right now is you see that we have input set of images, which is just 20 images to train on. Then we start with the Keras augmentation. What that does is it, it zooms and zooms out and it's a certain amount of rotations are applied to you know augment the data set a little bit. And that becomes my augmented image stack A1. And then what I can do is in my, my method two, I can just change the way in which the tiles are getting created instead of, of doing an over overlapping or a random uh, you know patch generation if, if we can do a non overlapping uh, you know so that means that there is no overlap between the patches that's generated that that way you'll get very finite number of tiles that get generated and now you get this augmented image stack too and then you pass that through your unit model and you finally get your segmented images so what we're saying is this combination of m1 and m2 together now you see because you're putting it in a particular pipeline you can look at the, at the limiting conditions of method one and method two separately so you'll be able to debug them separately and you'll also be able to understand the limiting conditions of both separately and ideally in this case we're we are seeing that uh, the amount of time or the number of patches that's getting generated uh, you know totally is also much lower and this way uh, if you have a lower computational complexity just because of, of, of the number of training patches that you require here if that is low and you're still able to get the same amount of uh, accuracy or output metrics uh, of, of interest then you've actually able you've been able to generalize it uh, modify something which is which which was E to E to explainable, and you've also been able to lower the computational complexity. So that's uh, with that in, in, in mind, the hypothesis that we are creating is that the combination of M1 and M2 in a certain way yields an explainable version of m2 so we've seen that m2 is actually an, an e to e you know method in which uh, you know you're, you're doing this uh, random extraction of patches and of course that's uh, that has an extremely high amount of uh, computational complexity but if you are able to combine m1 and m2 in the certain way that that i showed uh, we we should be able to lower the computational complexity and we've already benchmarked m1 and m2 separately now hyperparameterization is a 
is an extremely important part of machine learning and I cannot stress enough how important it is. So hyperparameterization means how do you come up with the optimal set of parameters that is going to ensure you have best performance in this integrated system that you've designed. And that, that's the catch. If, if you don't really know what are all the different uh, degrees of freedom or what are the different values that, that you can actually play with, you won't even know that you have come up with the ideal optimal set of parameters. So the first thing you need to do in order to ensure that you have the best uh, you know, operating conditions for your, your system model, you need to list out all of the possibilities or all the permutation combinations that you can actually play around. And after that, well, there are certain ways of, of getting to the best parameters the most commonly used one is a grid search uh, and this just would just be an example so if I had no overlap and if I was training just M2 with only 40 epochs I would be getting you know some uh, uh, and you, you, you can clearly see these uh, overlap the, the non overlapping uh, mosaic sort of structures which is not a good segmentation however now if I'm modifying it to the explainable augmentation that uh, you know I'm demonstrating so far here just with 40 epochs I'm actually getting a much better uh, resolution at uh, at the segmentation so it's, it's not Apache anymore and of course I, it, it looks much better the the for for the next week's uh, study we need to look at how many layers of unit is necessary for the vessel segmentation or we will call this ablation study uh, with the with the advent of, of unit uh, or with the advent of any deep learning network it's it's essentially to understand have you gone too far have you over parameterized it or have you under parameterized it in this case we will be looking at the unit depth of two three and four and we will be reporting the differences in order to see that this is the pretty size of unit which is optimal for the uh, you know image data augmentation and this is to follow next week so stay tuned